allons commencer. So, welcome everybody. Bienvenue à tous. Uh, nous avons le plaisir aujourd'hui de, de discuter avec vous d'un nouvel outil d'évaluation des luttes contre uh, la violence dans les écoles et qui est axé sur les droits de l'enfant. So this is a research project that we have been working on since 2013 and our research team includes here uh, Tara Collins who's a professor at Ryerson University in the School of Child and Youth Care. There's also Miad Ranjbar, who's a PhD student at McMaster uh, in sociology and who unfortunately couldn't make it today. We have Tate Chong sitting there at the laptop, who's a law student here at the University of Ottawa. Et moi, je suis uh, Mona Paré, je suis professeur ici à la Faculté de droit à l'Université d'Ottawa. We would also like to acknowledge all participants you here in the room and also all those who are following online joining us through live streaming from all over Canada. So we have people who are registered from Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, Yukon, Saskatchewan, PEI, uh, Manitoba, Nunavut and representing different areas, professional associations, academia, government, child and youth advocates, community organizations, um, and others. So keep in mind that the session is being live streamed and a video will be made available online after the session. So in attending today, you should understand that by remaining here, uh, you're providing your consent. Donc ce que ça veut dire, c'est que en étant ici, vous consentez à l'enregistrement de l'événement. Um, for those watching online, if you have any technical difficulties, so do remember that a video will be posted online afterwards. Also, if you are um, uh, following through live stream, you will be able to participate in the discussion through the chat function on the screen. Um, we acknowledge the financial support of the Canadian Bar Association to this project. Thank you. Um, and also we note that there's limited time today so we open the door to future discussions after this event by email or other means, and we will have an invitation um, for next steps in the conclusions. So, so now we turn to the agenda for our session today. First, we will be providing a background to the problem of violence in schools. Then we will provide background to the project give you a description of the process that we've pursued to date on this in this work. Then we will have an introduction to the tool, then followed by a few speakers on a panel to uh, provide their perspectives about the process and the project, uh, followed by discussion amongst us all here. So now we turn to the background on the problem of violence in schools. And we thank Miad Ranjibar, who prepared and planned to present these details, but unfortunately had to cancel this morning due to the flu. Uh, the literature provides for numerous definitions of the issue of bullying. The most prominent focuses on the victim bully di dyad. Bullying is defined to include intentionally hurtful acts directed towards victims, causing physical and or emotional stress. There are harmful effects at different levels affecting all the children involved, which are widely recognized in the literature. More recently, the issue of power has been added, yet the focus in the literature continues to remain on the individual child or children and the interactional patterns between the perpetrators, the, the victims, the bystanders, and school staff. Bullying is a systemic issue. Individual characteristics and interactional patterns are micro-level manifestations of larger social and political structures. The literature describes that the effectiveness of Canadian and international efforts at reducing bullying, for instance in relation to bullying intervention or prevention programs, are quite modest, as a number of meta-analyses and systematic reviews suggest. So 
So then uh, background to the project. So what we've noticed and uh, probably uh, you too is that the media has described many tragic events that have taken place in the last few years that are related to bullying. And this has probably, probably is one of the reasons for an increase of attention to school violence and particularly bullying, which you know the attention has been there definitely uh, for more than a decade. But in the last decades, there has been an increase, including more research done about it, including also a variety of responses from a variety of actors, all kinds of uh, responses uh, ranging, ranging from discipline, conflict re resolution to promotion of tolerance and friendship. Um, I'm sure you all have ideas about these. And coming from, both of us coming from uh, child rights research backgrounds, we set out to find out if child rights are included in these various efforts by academia, government, and civil society. So we were interested in knowing to what extent child rights are taken into account, and also interested in exploring um, child rights as an avenue to promote a common vision, and ensuring also that child rights are respected in the process uh, in these uh, anti-violence initiatives. And when we talk about child rights, what we mean is the human rights of children, uh, simply, and children understood as all persons under the age of 18. Um, children's rights need to be protected for many reasons. Um, one is that children are, you know, they deserve equal respect and concern as without discrimination as human beings. Uh, another one is that we need to recognize that children need protection, including from violence, and also that we need to recognize their place as full actors in the family, in school, in society, so including their right to participate in these different uh, fora. Um, uh, finally, we note that children's rights have been recognized in international law since the 1920s, but especially through the Convention on the Rights of the Child, adopted in 1989 and with 196 states, including Canada, having ratified it. So we find that child rights provide a valuable framework that guides us um, in terms of how to progress with children and youth, including in relation to school violence. So in terms of our research to date, we began with a project funded by the Social Sciences, Humanities and Research Council in 2013 to understand the problem and was as well to identify any gaps if there were any. So our methodology at that time was to constitute and be guided by um, a multi-sectoral advisory group. Uh, that had representation of different sectors, including admi school administrators, NGOs, and young people. We conducted an extensive literature review. We examined laws and policies from across the country with respect to education, violence, bullying, and so on. And we conducted interviews with key stakeholders, again, from across various sectors from across the country. And we engaged with young people uh, with in fo focus groups, several focus groups, as well as an online survey. And the results of this effort highlighted that there is a lack of or inconsistent evaluation of various anti-violence or anti-bullying initiatives, and that there is a gap of children's rights in, in to be considered in relation to these efforts. So based on this research, we developed a child rights-based approach to anti-violence efforts. And initiatives. And if people are interested, we are very happy to share publications with you. Just let us know. So next, the background to the development of the tool. Um, so the rationale behind the development of the tool is, as we noted, the gap between almost all anti-violence measures in schools and children's rights. And so we developed an evaluation tool 
to support our understanding of the relationship between the two, between violence, anti-violence measures on the one side and, and child rights on the other, and also to support progress. How did we do this? So the methodology, so here again, um, we composed an advisory committee and we acknowledge those who are in the room today and those who could not make it today. Um, our youth representatives both had conflicts with classes today. They are Karine Aya and Marley Gindel. Our NGO representatives are David Millen and Angela LaRusso. And we have academics um, Elisa Romano and Valerie Steves. And uh, there is Ginette, Ginette Thibault from the education se sector. And we thank all of them for their many months of support to this project. So what we started with was a literature review on evaluation, uh, quite generally, in the area of, um, of school violence and bullying. And we scanned existing <coughs> tools that are relevant to child rights, existing evaluation tools. Um, based on this research, we developed four draft tools that we then submitted to the advisory committee and had a discussion with the committee members. Uh, based on the discussions, uh, there were two mm, favored tools among the four and we collapsed them into, into one. Um, next, we proceeded to electronic consultations, reaching different sectors uh, across the country. We did that from September to end of November 2016. So, then we got responses from 25 people uh, from across the country, actually from uh, nine different provinces and territories, and who work in different sectors, um, educational, education professionals, academics, people from child, and, uh, child advocates offices, from provincial, territorial, and munici municipal governments, from NGOs and community organizations, from professional <coughs> associations, and also, also young people participated. So we thank everybody um, for their time and effort put into this tool. Then we went through a process of reflecting the comments and the questions in the tool that we had developed. And based on this process, we now have the resulting tool that we have copies of here in the room um, in French and in English and we sent electronic copies to those who are following us online. Now we turn to uh, an introduction to the tool. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that this tool aims to cut across various initiatives and institutions that it is designed for any actor or institution that develops, implements, and or evaluates or assesses anti-violence efforts in schools. We intended it to be simple to use and we assume an understanding of children's rights in the use of the tool. We stress that children's rights are not only about outcomes, which is a very common preoccupation for most program evaluations. And so it is important to keep in mind that the various elements of the tool put a real emphasis on the processes in order to support children's rights. We also highlight that children's rights provide a basis for a common approach and an understanding to the complex issue of bullying or violence in schools. And the tool is designed to encourage uniformity in addressing the issue and problem of school violence help monitor the application of children's rights, as well as heighten understanding and awareness of children's rights for all those interested in and working in this education sector. So then about using the tool, so um, what you have there, it's, um, it's an interactive PDF, so that can be used um, in its electronic form. It should be used as part of a participatory process, as participatory as possible, preferably. And in any case, we recommend involving more than one person in the evaluation process to assess any one initiative. 
We also recommend that the evaluation results be discussed and that they should inform the development of next steps through a discussion among those involved. Um, all of that is actually explained in the introduction of the tool. Donc, vous avez l'explication de ces points dans l'introduction de l'outil. And now we turn to a description, a brief description of the structure of the tool. And you will see that it is organized into five different sections. So the first section provides for a general description of the initiative under consideration. The second process identifies the process and development of the initiative in question. So it is um, important for um, the assessors to find out what were the considerations in the development of the initiative. Uh, were children's rights considered? And providing deta ask details about the involvement of stakeholders in the development of that initiative. Thirdly, we turn to the content of the initiative. It uh, asks questions and requires details about how the initiative reflects children's rights in implementation. So for instance, are children's rights to participate considered? Their rights to development considered? Is there attention to specific groups? And uh, prevention of discrimination, and so on. Fourthly, the, the, the tool considers and highlights the effectiveness of the implementation efforts in practice. Because we all know we have in may, uh, in initiatives may have intentions, but how are they realized in practice or not? And so that is the purpose of section four, where we um, ask questions related to how the initiative reflects children's rights in practice. For instance, is there knowledge of children's <coughs> rights? What are the roles and responsibilities of the actors in relation to implementing the initiative? Are there avenues for individuals and groups to voice their concerns and complaints? And is there consideration for responding to those concerns? And lastly, as Mona pointed out just a moment ago, we highlight the importance in the fifth section of follow-up to the assessment. This is particularly important because it requires attention to what information was used, what are recommendations to improve children's rights, and it also requires uh, the development of an action plan with a timeline to guide next steps. That also involves and requires the di discussion among the stakeholders of the initiative as well as with the assessors. So now we have a um, few minutes for uh, questions, for clarifications, um, then the more general question no, and comments that you may have will be addressed during the discussion. Donc, uh, gardez les questions et les commentaires uh, plus généraux pour la période de discussion qui, qui suivra. Donc maintenant, ce sont juste des questions pour, uh, des, pour les clarifications par rapport à ce, qu ce que vous venez d'entendre. Um, and also, please, uh, please uh, remember that because this is um, this is um, live streamed. Live streamed. Mm -hmm. So and we recorded. will ask <laughs> recorded. So we will ask you to speak up so that the microphones will pick up your questions. So that uh, voila. Okay. <laughs> yes. So my question, <coughs> question is one since the first time I looked. Did you look at the research that really talked about the school climate? Because to me, uh, I think enough, some of the research that I've seen says that what really works is when the climate of the school, the norms of the school change, and less is the focus on the individual and more on the norms. Did you look at that? Did you find some of that? Well, and that was an issue that was very much highlighted by the interviews that we took place with stakeholders as well as by the focus groups themselves. Um, the issue of the school climate, of course, is an important consideration. Um, and we try to bring out 
uh, elements of that in relation to the tool in general. Um, but we also, uh, the intention of the tool was very much for initiatives not only to be about institutions or about those in authority, but w thinking also about where are the children and what are their perspectives and where are their human rights in relation to that. But you bring a very important point that needs to be brought forward and, and highlighted to, to everyone when they're thinking about the tool. Mm. And and yes, I think this is uh, has been of concern to various actors. Mm -hmm. So not only something that uh, does come up in research, but also in those responses that we talked about. Mm -hmm. You know that there are various responses, and many of the responses tr try to address the issue of school climates mm -hmm. um, in in different ways. But I it is there. Um, so what we want to bring in with this tool is the adding the child rights perspective, which m perhaps more um, um, less directly, more indirectly uh, addresses the issue of the, of the school climate as well. Uh, Michael Montgomery, I'm an advisor to the Western Quebec uh, School Board on anti-violence. <coughs> tools are fantastic. I'm really happy that you're developing uh, a tool that can actually start to evaluate because there's very few evaluation tools available in relation to this issue. But a couple of observations. One would be that most um, initiatives come out of law. They actually come out of an obligation by school boards to put into place mm -hmm. initiatives. Um, the other observation would be that focusing on the school community is actually also part of that issue, which mm -hmm. is that parents have a responsibility, students have a responsibility, um, teachers and administrators have responsibilities. Um, another observation would be um, in relation to language. A lot of initiatives don't take a rights-based approach to language. Yes. Yeah, so we talked about the, the dyadic approach. Um, generally, you know, we have the victim bully opposition, but definitely there's a recognition also, uh, especially in the in the literature of the existence of the bystanders, the, the witnesses, and that's like the third category. So you end up with three categories of children, and what we found at that also, well, yes, it does recognize that there are others than just a victim and a bully. But um, but that's still in a limited way of, mm -hmm. of, of looking at the issues, um, and we kind of try to go beyond that those those labels and categories. And mm -hmm. why child rights has an important role to play to inform those that language, for instance, uh, because right now it's not being considered. And and you know young people themselves are saying, for instance, that they um, you know that bullying as a term is doesn't reflect the reality of that they're experiencing and they found it very problematic as well so um, we actually have a whole host of uh, description about all of that in the literature but of course this is the next step of uh, following that work uh, this tool of response to that in order to highlight why you know who is involved and that it's a much greater understanding than that typical um, and uh, and and how how this tool can support understanding of how children's rights can inform the issue and inform the schools and inform responses to to the issues of violence in schools. Mm -hmm. Recognizes that everything gets lumped as bullying. Exactly. When in fact there's meanness, there's teasing, there's conflict. Exactly. And unless children are actually supported in dealing with those things. Um, bullying itself doesn't get dealt with in exactly. the way that it needs to get dealt with. Exactly. But principals have a problem because everything is defined mm -hmm. as bullying. Exactly. And therefore their time's taken up with, with parents a lot of the time trying to work out, well, was it bullying or was it something else? Mm -hmm. Yes. So mm -hmm. Yeah, we find that uh, difficulty there actually dealing with and, and choosing terminology and so you'll see that sometimes we may refer to bullying and sometimes we refer to violence so we refer to bullying because this is what you know people understand what we're talking about um if, if we say bullying and there is a lot <coughs> of uh, research on bullying and lots of uh, good research you know it really helps us understand the problem 
Um, but as Tara said, you know, um, uh, people we uh, spoke with, uh, we interviewed, and, and, and especially uh, children and young people, uh, found the term, um, they didn't like the term. Um, we can talk about this um, later again. And we prefer to, as much as possible, use the term violence, which is um, more rights-based, mm -hmm. you know, that's about the ch child's protection from violence and all types of violence. Okay. during the consultations? Yes, they were uh, as part of the consultations right from the beginning of the project. Um, but with respect to the tool, we had uh, young people on our advisory committee who participated right from the start and also provided commentary uh, f as the tool evolved over time and including this most recent version. very much appreciate the comprehensive nature of this, and I think I provided some, some comments along the way. Appreciate the, um, but my questions revolve, I guess, a tension that we, we all experience. The, the comprehension, comprehensiveness of it comes into some tension with it needing to be an evaluation tool for a program from within a context. So that's one question, that tension. Did that come up, and how do you see managing that? The second is, um, it almost seems like it might be more of a pre-planning tool than an evaluation, because if you haven't planned with all of this in mind, so I'm wondering, did you consider making it a pre-planning tool versus an evaluation? If you ran a program and then you wanted to evaluate and you didn't plan with this framework, you'd, you'd really be... Um, that's my yeah. question. Yeah. So two things. One, there's tension between you know, this, this could be the whole school, right? It has to be a program. Um, and the second would be pre versus evaluation. Okay, well done. So thank you, Kathy, for the, the great questions. Um, certainly, um, you highlight an important issue because we very explicitly wanted a tool that could be useful across institutions and actors and that it would have usefulness to highlight various child rights considerations with respect to the initiatives, whether they happen to be a law, whether they happen to be a policy, whether they happen to be a program, whether <coughs> they were a program designed and implemented by young people themselves, whether it was, um, uh, uh, as Michael highlighted, uh, a response, a program or a policy in response to the legal obligations that uh, the provincial government, for instance, has laid out for itself. So. Um, so it is very, we do try to be as comprehensive as possi possible, but I think during the, um, the revisions and the consultations and with our advisory committee, we also highlighted the issue of um, the pre-planning aspect, as you pointed out, Kathy. And um, for us, we wanted a tool that would not simply be uh, inform and exercise in a point in time but recognizing that some initiatives may not be considering children's rights at all, or maybe only considering the right to participate to a certain extent, or may only be concerned about um, the issue of discrimination against a certain group. These are all examples. But what we, we wanted for our tool is that it could serve beyond the process of that one individual assessment and serve the process of developing future initiatives as well. So that is to say, as an interactive PDF, it shouldn't be done just by one person, it should be done by multiple people, and that the results of the assessment can inform next steps with respect to that individual in initiative, whatever it happens to be, but also inform future steps about responding to gaps that the initiative hasn't covered and maybe other initiatives need to be developed in cooperation with other actors, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is something to, as we, described during our introduction to promote children's rights and support <coughs> understanding that children's rights aren't just about outcomes but about processes and that engages young people themselves as part of the process. Um, we recognize that there will be initiatives where this particular tool, um, you know, there will be lots of no answers, that it doesn't respond to their reality. But that doesn't mean it's irrelevant because it can help inform, well, actually, maybe I should start thinking about, you know, discrimination against, you know, all other groups. Maybe I should start thinking about, oh, involving young people in considering this initiative, examples like that. So 
question. Mm -hmm. Yes, what I want to say also is that, that want we wanted the tool to be kind of um, large enough so that it could be used at different points of um, development and application and, and you know, use of an initiative doesn't have to be at the end, could be at any point and it really should help to get a discussion going about this, you know, get people together and uh, I guess uh, it's partly an awareness raising tool and partly, you know, a tool that helps planning uh, for um, other initiatives and improving on the initiative that they already have, etc. And we want it to be different from a child rights impact assessment tool per se, which is only before uh, we start a new initiative. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for clarification? And um, we'll be having opportunities for discussion soon. Oh, uh, the other one would be, are child rights uh, within a particular board on the curriculum? Mm -hmm. um, and I would say within our board, it's shockingly and surprisingly to me, being a child rights person, I don't know any school that's actually teaching so there, you know, if you're asking the question, you might also want to have some of the answers for some of the schools mm -hmm. in terms of how they might be able to quickly correct that issue. Um, I'd be interested also to hear in other parts of Quebec, but also in Ontario, mm -hmm. how many boards actually uh, openly talk about child rights. Mm. Now, there is a question there about do the children know about their rights? Mm -hmm. And every question you may just, you know, uh, tick the agree or disagree or, or, or whatever, but you also have a comment box and that would allow you, you know, as uh, somebody who's <coughs> assessing an initiative to put a comment about curriculum, for example, mm -hmm. there if you feel that <coughs> the children actually don't know about their rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions yeah. for clarification? Otherwise, we'll ask our panelists to please join us at the front if they may. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, going to um, highlight that unfortunately one of our young uh, youth representatives um, had to cancel her participation on this panel due to a class conflict. But we are very pleased to have um, our advisory committee representatives. Uh, we have um, Alyssa Romano, who is a professor in uh, clinical psychology here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, her research concerns child maltreatment and intervention evaluation, and she's received a reward for research excellence by the Faculty of Social Sciences in 2016. We had um, another uh, member of our advisory committee who is Angela LaRusso, who is a citywide capacity builder and lead of prevention coalition and she was going to provide the community development perspective but unfortunately she has been struck ill with the flu as well this very morning so we are eternally grateful to our wonderful colleague <laughs> from the advisory <laughs> committee uh, Valerie Steves filling in to uh, our panel so that it is actually a panel of more than one person um, and she is a professor at criminology um, at the University of Ottawa so there to give their perspectives uh, about um, this connection between child rights and anti-violence initiatives and assessment and um, their perspectives on the tool as they see fit. So thank you very much to the two of you. We are very grateful. Do you want to go ahead? Let's go. Um, speak into the, the microphone. Speak into yeah. the yeah. mic. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here and I apologize that I was late to get here so I might be a bit repetitive. I also just as Pramona's request made a few little remarks, so nothing too extensive. Um, but just coming at it from a research perspective, I guess looking at the development of the tool, there were several things that I appreciated and I just wanted to share that and, and perhaps start a discussion. I think one is that it's got a conceptual grounding, um, the conceptualization being children's rights and that's something that we don't often see, but it's always important to ground a tool, I think, in some kind of conceptualization. Also was guided by past efforts in terms of past research on this type of evaluation tool. So in terms of a grounding, I think it's on, it has a solid foundation, and that's, uh, I think, a really nice aspect of the tool. I think also the fact that it is structured 
and in some way standardized can really increase its utility in the sense that it could be used, and I know we were having this discussion just before, over time, kind of like as a pre-post thing. So you might fill it out before an intervention as a kind of a baseline assessment of what, are, what is your current understanding, where are your gaps. Use, use it as a way to inform the development of any kind of intervention, and then use it perhaps post or at follow-up assessments as a way to keep monitoring um, the progress that you've made. So it's a really nice way to track something in a standardized way over time, but also given that it's a tool that could be used across settings, across contexts, it's a way to standardize that process across these different contexts. Often with research, it's really hard to summarize our understanding because the methodologies vary so differently, the definitions we're using, the approach. So we often talk about if we can all kind of agree on a systematic way of doing something, it will add clarity to our interpretation of results. So I think it, it's, it could really be beneficial in this way. And finally, my, my other comment was just in terms of the content, um, I think that it is comprehensive. And in this way, it really gets us to think about issues in, in a way that maybe never dawned on us as something that we maybe need to consider. Um, and so I really appreciated the comprehensiveness of it. But also, I think the fact that it's comprehensive and structured but also I think there's flexibility in there mm -hmm. and that makes it for a nice tool where um, it can be applied in different contexts even though the purpose might be slightly different. Um, so that, those were just some of my initial kind of thinking about the, the tool. Well, I too just have uh, some brief comments that I wanted to make because I'm really looking forward to the conversation actually and I'm delighted to see so many people around the table and on the internet. Um, one of the hats I wear is as a lead researcher of Media Smarts, Young Canadians and Wired World Research Projects. So we've been in the field since 1999, three or four times, and, 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 and talking to kids both before, during and after that arc of creating cyberbullying interventions and bullying interventions as a whole. And the thing that always strikes me when you sit down and talk to young people about bullying, as soon as the word comes up, they go, ugh, they're so frustrated with us adults. Um, and they're frustrated for really good reasons, I think, and it picks up on a number of the comments that were made earlier. There are a range of behaviors that are being sucked into this vortex. So on one end of that spectrum, you have communications that, from the kid's point of view, aren't problematic at all. And my favorite example of this is two uh, 13 and 14-year-old girls in Toronto doing a focus group. They're best friends. And, and somebody brings up bullying and they roll their eyes and go, you won't believe what happened to us. Um, it was just after March break, they got back, they were sitting there, they were comparing tans, and one girl said to the other girl, ha, I'm darker than you. And they were sent to the principal for racist bullying because they both happen to be African Canadians and they're not allowed to talk about skin color. And, and I think that's a really important example because when you talk to kids about it, they don't necessarily say, my right under the Convention for on the Rights of the Child has been violated, but they know what it means to not have freedom of speech. And they know what it means not to be listened to. And they know what it means not to have freedom of association or privacy. Because so often, the responses of institutions to all of that range of problems has been a surveillance response. We just watch them all the time. Watch them like hawks. Don't let them say things. Control what they say. And kids very much need language to express that back to adults. And child rights language gives them a way of, of participating in that conversation. Um, interestingly enough, at the other end of the spectrum, we've talked to kids across the country that really were experiencing violence and needed uh, uh, help. <laughs> you know, they needed interventions. They were looking for it. And we were told repeatedly right across the country that the types of systems that were in place made it even more difficult for them to go to a teacher or to a community worker because as soon as they did, they lost control. And again, I think that speaks to an, a, a rights issue. Agency is crucial here. So certainly when, we talk, when, I, when I think about you know, what, what we've heard from our, our, our research um, participants over the years, I think so much of it resonates with this tool. 
Um, first of all, call it violence, because that's what it is. Don't bug us when we're just goofing around, but when we do have problems, we want to talk about the systemic causes of those problems. We're much less interested in making sure Johnny gets kicked out of school than we are in dealing with sexism, racism, homophobia. And, and there's a space there within this generation to have really productive and, and important um, conversations about these systemic problems. Um, so, so I think addressing it as violence is absolutely crucial and certainly resonates with what we hear from kids. Um, secondly, I, I really like the way the tool constantly reinforces that you're not working on kids, you're working with kids. This is a community response to a community problem. And that, that those reminders within the tool that you should be talking to people, that they are not just widgets, but they are agents, I think is incredibly important. Um, lastly, I think that the tool just by existing <laughs> is actually incredibly useful because it opens up a possibility to use the language of human rights to understand problems around conflict and, and um, structural violence. And, and just in doing that, it opens up a space for all of us as a community, whether it's young people or it's adults seeking to help young people, to think about the connections between kids' behaviors, kids' needs, our interventions, and their need for human dignity their need for the respect of their rights, their need to be recognized as equal actors. Uh, and, and I think that in many ways that alone will help address some of the comments you raised about so, uh, school climate. School climate points to the fact that this is a community problem and it requires a community response. Too often we go for this simple, straightforward, instrumental, call the cops report, you know, that those put them under surveillance kind of things. Those are making it worse. And I think that th this tool will help push us in a direction where we can begin to have these much more nuanced conversations about, about um, uh, children's rights within the Canadian context. So I, I would like to applaud the entire research team, and I'm really delighted to have the leadership and, and develop this very practical, use, useful tool for us. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa and, and, and Val, for, for these comments. And we hope that there'll be now a, a good basis for us to start a discussion, a wider discussion on this tool, on the use of it, on the possible challenges and opportunities. Um, whatever you'd like to share with us, uh, comments you may have. So, um, voila. Donc, um, Vous pouvez intervenir en anglais, en français, comme vous le voulez, comme vous le voulez, dans la salle ou alors à l'extérieur. Uh, could you please clarify the definition of children's rights? And will the people who will be using this tool be informed of this definition of children's rights? So children's rights, um, as I mentioned earlier, we mean human rights of children. Um, human rights of children... Um, as they are, generally we use the Convention on the Rights of the Child as a guiding tool because it pretty much includes all the human rights of children, so including the general um, rights and freedoms that everybody would have. Uh, you know, uh, Val talked about privacy and, and uh, freedom of expression and other such rights, but also rights that children have because they are children, because of their special status, uh, 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 age and development and, and dependency, et cetera, you know, related to their relationship with the family, et cetera, that we wouldn't have as adults, but they have as children. So that's why, because the Convention on the Rights of the Child includes that whole package of rights as we recognize them for children, we use that as a, as a framework. And in the tool, we have we refer to resources specifically, so we have um, links mm -hmm. to tools um, that help uh, understand what child rights are. So not just links to the convention, but also just some uh, um, educational tools and, and others. Any other uh, questions, uh, comments? Well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm taking up on Valerie's comments about language, because language is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And we 
even in the area where you talk about the best interest of the child, you say focus, and what focus means is that I'm here and you're there. Mm -hmm. And there might be some other way of wording that. The best interest of the child, or, you know, must be considered as an important component or something. But the moment you talk about focusing, it becomes an us, we, you know, them kind of thing. Because I, I feel uh, absolutely that this, that this is a question of climate, it's a question of relationships, it's a question of what are the kids being exposed to in, uh, in the culture surrounding them? How are they relating to the media? Uh, and the messages from the media and so on, those are all parts of the component. And so the question then comes to me, have you any idea who would even use this to? <laughs> I mean, have you, sorry, that's a, that's a serious question. Have you got some idea of who would use this tool? Well, our, it certainly designed it so that it could be used by a wide range of actors. And I think um, the, the representation of the various actors and sectors that we had during the consultations and in, in the purposes of this particular online and in-person session here, um, we're hoping that others would be interested. I see that Val has a comment. Yeah, I was just going to say, actually, we've been, we've been working, I'm, uh, with Jane Bailey, I'm co-leader of a project called the Equality Project, and we're, we're working with young people. And um, we've approached some people, we're just kind of setting this up right now, but there are groups within schools of students that are active on these types of issues. And I think, actually, I think it would be an incredibly powerful tool for them when they're thinking about how um, they would like to interact with the administration in regard to certain projects. So that would be a group that mm -hmm. I think would find it incredibly mm -hmm. useful, mm -hmm. the students themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had also a, a school principal on our advisory uh, committee who said that she could imagine, you know, using this kind of tool, and so that's why we've had uh, input from people from different sectors who felt that it could be used. And this is part of the discussion, actually, that we also want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. How do you think you might be able to use the tool, or? Who do you think should be able to use the tool? But just a, a comment also quickly about the, the word you mentioned, focus. So um, if you have you know, those kinds of comments about uh, wording that might be problematic, we can still make changes. So we, we have this version today, um, and there is still room before I, we actually send it online. If you feel strongly about some wording, we're happy to receive those comments. Um, we did struggle a lot with some of the wording for the questions, making sure that it packs enough information, but it's concise, <coughs> that it's as much in plain language as possible, because we want the tool to be used by those also who might not have this, you know, the same uh, kind of knowledge mm -hmm. that uh, y you and I have. Uh, so we, it was really difficult, especially something, you know. Uh, a concept like the best interest of the child, we did have discussions as to how to frame it so that it is clear what we are talking about, but so it's very simple too. So if you have suggestions, we're very happy to receive those. Mm -hmm. My question is about distribution of the tool and how you plan on, I guess, publicizing it and making it accessible to the actors that you're hoping to serve. So um, part of our plan is to put it up online uh, with uh, various actors. Uh, various organizations have already expressed interest in being a doing that. Um, we also hope to have the video to, uh, from today's session to support understanding of the tool, as well as producing a, a report from today's discussion and taking in all your various questions and comments uh, into that report as well. So um, at this stage, of course, we're looking, we're releasing this tool today, but our, as Mona's pointed out, we are certainly open to continuing to consider uh, comments and, and questions in relation to the tool, but our intention is to look look at the next steps, which we will be talking about in our in our conclusion for today. Um, but absolutely, um, we welcome your help in distributing the tool with, who, with whomever you, and whatever institutions you think or organizations might be interested in using it. Mm -hmm. uh, two observations, Kathy, Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. One is the PrevNet network. Um, over the years, they have moved to the framework of uh, rights relationship. I don't know yeah. if they may be on the line somewhere, but it seems to me um, they have moved to that, and that's been positive. Um, but this kind of thing might well, and there's an existing network. 
And the other, I'll just make an observation. I've been monitoring the submissions to the parliamentary committee looking at violence against um, young girls. Unfortunately, they finished their inputs, but there was very little right spaces there, and they could certainly use um, an injection of this. And that's you know, going to frame what we do across the country with a, a national strategy on violence. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, certainly, we will actually um, uh, share this also through the PrevNet uh, network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. And PrevNet's watching online as well today. So. And various members. And various also. members yes. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, does anyone have other ideas or uh, in terms of how the tool could be used or who it should, should use it? <coughs> I work for um, the Quebec Provincial Association of Teachers, so teachers across Quebec. And I, I could see different levels. I, definitely we have a human rights and social justice community. So teachers, this is something that's very important to them. And it's, I think that this would be a tool that they would like to use. And I also have in mind, I know all teachers, but particularly new teachers. I think that that's something they hold very close to their heart. So I would see the push with the new teachers. And I also see this as, um, it's a tool for teachers, but I also see it as something that you would do to empower your own students. And I think often teachers don't have um, especially when they begin, they feel like they don't have enough resources, they don't know how to empower their students, and I think that this would be an ideal way. So uh, that's how I'm, I'm seeing it, uh, through the teachers. That's great, thank you. <laughs> Any other thoughts about the use of it, so the, the, the people and the contexts? Well, I had a question, I mean, I was teaching yeah. a class yesterday at, at RYU, um, and, and uh, it was mostly uh, child protection. They want something even simpler. <laughs> they sort of said, well, as we go out to work as, you know, ones in criminology and become a parole officer, uh, what, this is already, I mean, it's, it's, it's good stuff and it's very hard to pick up, but I'm wondering if it's, it's ever going to be possible to do a one-pager that gives them the salient points, <laughs> just the salient points. I, they said, asked me, and I said, well, you know, my first advice is listen to the kids. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then give you some ideas about how you listen to babies, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of us needed to know that when we had babies. <laughs> um, but that was my first, I, I, I think there's a need for that, for, to get a broader spread. I think you've got a lot of the stuff in here. If there was any way that you could just do a abstract. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a tool or as an information document? So that well, it could. It, 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 I mean, they could use it as a tool. I mean, I, it's a question I've had many times, and and they just say, well, we don't know how to apply the child rights perspective to our work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and I've been looking. I haven't found a tool that is simple. Something that you can almost do on the fly, but makes you think, mm -hmm. gives you that aha moment, you know. Oh, but I think I think that kind of work really does require child rights awareness and training as well, you know, in the curriculum for teachers and other practitioners, so that they have an awareness and then they can subsequently use such a tool to flag various things. But certainly, there is a real gap for how children's rights in relation to practice that I'm very interested in, in filling <laughs> now and in the future. Um, but one of the things um, that I've come to realize is that um, it would be very hard to support practitioners beyond any one sector. So that is to say, in order for it to be meaningful to teachers, it has to refer to teacher concerns, curriculum concerns, et cetera, et cetera. In order to be relevant and pertinent as, say, an abstract or a tool or one page or what have you, it would have to be pertinent to principals. It would have to be pertinent to child and youth care workers. It would have to be pertinent to lawyers. Um, so um, I think that's something that needs to be explored further. I think our intention with this tool is to help people understand how children's rights can inform and influence their practice in the school, se in the education sector, how whoever, you know, whatever perspective they're coming to. Um, it can't be 
Um, it, you know, yes, it's true, it'd be nice to have a one pager, but the reality is a lot of people don't even, wouldn't be able to make sense of what that one pager is if they don't have prior child rights training or education efforts. And so that it behooves all of us, I think, to really do what we can to raise children's rights awareness and produce more tools, including short ones, um, for take up and, 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 and application. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And so this one, it isn't. We don't have particularly language that's um, for children or language that's, you know, for, as Tara said, for different different uh, professionals. Uh, we tried to make it as general as possible mm -hmm. and as simple. You know, that's. I think that was one of the concerns was uh, simple use. So it is. It is about. It is about 10 pages or so so mm -hmm. it is it is it does look long but it is simple to use and you can uh, there's flexibility in the use you know that you may just tick boxes or you might take time to actually write comments under under each one so there's that that flexibility uh, so that that was one concern was the length and 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 simplicity um, and what we did here also and we're very much aware of that was the lack of training and does this help you know does it bring what does it bring to the training you know the prior training to actually using the tool etc um, it, it doesn't more than it does uh, you know refer to educational mat material etc but it would be useful for sure to have something mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe those more um, more focused one pagers or something like that but we do have um, links in the introduction uh, in the two versions, the English and the French versions, for online resources for uh, individuals and institutions to become uh, more familiar with child rights language. And we highlight uh, the excellent training model modules that Landon Pearson Resource Center has produced. There's a link available there with videos and useful um, training uh, introduction to children's rights for those who need that. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming from within a frame of how does this sit within the frame of the system that I'm working in. Okay? And what I see is that this is aspirational because most schools are not dealing with child rights. Mm -hmm. But it's good to promote them and it's good to get people moving in that direction. So that's useful. The other thing is, this is a really important moment in the existence of, because, and again, it's the use of initiative and policy. Mm -hmm. Most schools function within a policy framework. Mm -hmm. Most policies came into existence around anti-violence in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. There were a series of things happening which made national headlines, kids were committing suicide, and a lot of legislation was put into place. In Western Quebec, it was, I think, 2002. Law 19, Bill 56. Within that framework, it's been running for 10 to 12, 13 years. There needs to be an assessment of how are we doing with this? What's working, what's not working? What are we learning? What are the strengths that individual schools have? This is pre existent to all of this, right? I see this, if you're talking about initiatives, that's a slightly different focus for me. Um, I think there's a lot of learning and, and the learning is not yet being tapped into research-wise in relation to how have we done over the last 15 years with existing policies. That would be a point at which an aspirational issue comes up, which is how do we move forward? And this for me is where this starts to make much more sense in my framework, in, in the frame that I have. If you may have a <coughs> I agree with Michael. I'm a principal in the Western Quebec School Board, so I work with teachers and with parents in the governing board. And in fact, tonight we have uh, a governing board meeting, and we are voting on the school board's anti-violence, anti-bullying plan for the year. And when I see a tool like this, and I think of our own plan within the board, within our school, there is an ab there's an absence of the child's rights perspective. There's programs that school boards want to adopt or the government wants to adopt, but they, they just want to take something easy. Mm -hmm. And this is a great starting point for teachers to be able to have a framework to follow, to, to bring to their consciousness 
a different way of looking at things from a child's perspective. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely been a gap. And so I've got a, a meeting tonight to pass something and I'm thinking, hold on a second, maybe I should table that for a month or two and take a deeper reflection because it is very program based within a legislation in a province that's a reaction to as what Michael just said. So it's very good for administrators, teachers, to take that step back to look from a different perspective. And so this is great. That's great. Yeah, and let's, as, as we explained it in the tool, so it's something when we say initiative, initiative, <coughs> it can be a particular program that's, you know, uh, um, adopted by a school board, but it can also be the actual provincial law, you know, like the Ontario and Quebec laws that were adopted about the same time, and now it's been a few years, so it would be a good timing now to actually look back at, you know, what, what has been done since mm -hmm. then. And within the framework of those laws, there have been many in individual initiatives and how the individual initiatives work as well. I wanted to, in Quebec, we have the system that you were just mentioning, governing boards, and essentially those are made up, we have the principal on the committee, teachers, students, community members, and parents. It, it, all the stakeholders from the education community come together, and I, I would see, um, this would be of interest to that, because the whole premise behind the governing boards is the interest of the students, the well-being of the school, the running of the school, and the interest of the students, so I would see how this would be a very helpful tool for governing boards, and I see how they would be particularly interested in That there's uh, some ideas uh, coming, you know, uh, teachers and, and, and school governing bo boards, and uh, who else do you think that should be informed uh, of this tool? You know, if we want to build this uh, uh, strategy of, of sharing the tool and, and informing uh, people about it, who do you think we should? Hmm? Yeah. Faculties of education. Faculties of education. <laughs> I work with the Canadian Teachers Federation, and we are um, in the line of the Canadian Teachers Organization, and um, we work with Bowdy on the uh, Young Canadian for a lot of work. Uh, no, not the Young Canadian, the Young Well, yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and you work a lot with Media Smarts and Mobile and International Media Literacy Week in November. But anyway, this is a wonderful tool, and I also, as an intermedia for the Ontario Provincial, is that teachers need the tool, because sometimes it's bearing fruit uh, that governments impose on school boards to get us done, and they're often you know, scrambling to try to the easiest route to be able to uh, satisfy the needs of their, their superiors. So, but we do have a social justice program at the Canadian Teachers Federation called Imagine Action, where we encourage teachers and students to look at the community in which they live, whether it's in the school or in the community, and look for gaps and initiate projects. initiatives to counter bullying have often been initiated by, by teachers and students, thanks to the, uh, you know, it's the students that are leading the, uh, the initiative. And I could see this posted on our Imagine Action uh, website, which is available, we have over 5,000 teachers registered, and to encourage them to look at the initiative when they're, they're thinking of constructing or building an initiative, this would be very valuable. But I, to answer your question, who else? I think governments, mm -hmm. provincial ministries of education, definitely. They're the ones that are, you know, feeding into yes. yeah, yeah, that, yes. that's where the, the policies come from, and, uh, yeah. and so on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yes. Uh, Can I just make two comments? This might have been already said, but I think child welfare could really mm -hmm. benefit from a tool like this. Child welfare, yeah. mm -hmm. especially in supporting um, parents or or uh, parenting. Sometimes children that have very strong sensitize them even more to the rights of these children that have already been um, <coughs> violated in many, many ways as a function of their history. And then the other comment is I'm just looking at the items again, and I really appreciate the sensitivity in which they're written. Because I think when we talk about bullying, we often think there's a really bad kid that's perpetrating violence, and then there's the victim. Um, and at the end of the day, this perpetrator, if you want to call him that, this bully, is a child. 
Um, and I think the language really opens us up to really always bearing in mind that this is a child uh, and we should look at the unique needs and circumstances of this child that often are in the context of community and family because violence and aggression doesn't just happen, it's not just driven by the child's internal makeup. There are many other factors and I think we need to be sensitized to the larger context in which aggression occurs. And I like it. And it also, I think when you keep mentioning children, is to really keep us aware in the forefront of our minds that this is a child we're talking about who has unique needs and, and needs to be treated in a sensitive manner and not in a punitive way uh, because they might be engaging in aggression. There's, there's a reason why and we need to understand why and not just put kind of solutions to deal with the behavior. So I really appreciate that. And, and whenever I hear about bullying, I always have to think about the context because I think it's become very, it's lost meaning and we often think about bullying as there's a perpetrator and a victim, but aggression always occurs within a wider context. So we need to be looking at the family and the community as well, especially with young children. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we, we were talking about the um, um, children, young people using the tool. So one question we, we had for you is, how do you think that, that children and young people could be supported in, in using uh, this tool? And we need to speak louder. Okay, thank yeah. you for letting oh, us know. Okay, yes. So everybody, please speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So do people have ideas as to how young people themselves can be supported in, in using this tool? Uh, well, for us, we, uh, I work for the Canadian Red Cross and we do develop some violence prevention programs and we have one for bullying prevention. And it's mostly based on young people um, deliver, uh, having workshops uh, into their classrooms and talking to their peers about the issues. So I'm seeing this as a tool that they could be using with the help of an adult advisor or a teacher in their classroom to see, okay, are we really including child rights into our initiatives and into the workshops that we're doing? Mm -hmm. So this is one way we could, to answer your question. But also I was thinking about like other people who could be using these tools are any youth serving organizations, sports organizations now sometimes, they, they also want to uh, in, uh, include um, bullying prevention into their activities. Uh, faith organizations also could beneficiate from these tool, uh, this tool. So I think we need to open it up. And organizations like mine who develop uh, child protection programs, this is a great tool for us to be like, okay, are we really doing it? And how can we do it better? Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for your work. <coughs> thank you. I think um, um, uh, looking at the people leaving the room, time is uh, running out. And uh, thank you for your comments. Merci beaucoup. So um, we'll move on to the conclusions now. So concerning the future process, as we mentioned, so there will be a, a video, the tool, a report that will be uh, available electronically online. And um, if we have your email address, if if you haven't emailed us previously, and if you haven't, well, if you have emailed us previously, and or if you have written your name and uh, email address on that um, paper there, we'll be able to keep you informed and send you links so we'll know which websites um, they'll be available at. So you are most welcome to use any of these items, the tool and the other documents in your activities, so it is for everybody's use. Donc c'est ça, nous vous encourageons en fait à utiliser l'outil et les autres documents et ensuite à ne pas hésiter à nous envoyer des questions, des commentaires et nous dire, nous, de nous dire comment vous utilisez l'outil. So we do want to hear about if you use the tool, um, how do you use it and, and any comments you may have about it. So um, yes, um, we're planning uh, future research, so uh, testing the tool, and we're invited all. We're inviting all the participants, all the participants, whoever is in, interested in participating in this uh, testing process. So do let us know um, if you are 
interested or keep us informed about the use of the tool, et cetera, we will uh, build all that in into the research. So and in closing, we wanted to turn to the words of young people who have been involved in this research um, because they highlight the importance of child rights and the necessity of advancing them in relation to anti-violence efforts. So one young person said, I think making it a rights issue kind of escalates it from some, just something that is like unpleasant or annoying to a really serious problem. It really makes people think. Another young person said, even the kind of language that you use when you are talking about children's rights and those kinds of things makes it more of a big issue as opposed to the language that we use with bullying, which is passive a lot of the time. People don't take it as seriously. In another focus group, one young person said, the more they talk about child rights, the more we're educated about it, and people can actually go out and seek help or use it as an advantage. So we thank you all very much for your interest and support, and we hope that we may stay in touch with you all as we continue our efforts to support children's rights and anti-violence in schools. Merci. Merci, merci, uh, merci à tous, donc à tous, à tous ceux qui participent aussi à l'extérieur, and those who are in the room, please help yourselves to more food. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All the best. Thank you.